Welcome to another CO2 Monday in the Refrigeration Mentor Podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews. And once again, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time each week to come and learn a little bit about CO2, share some knowledge with me. Uh, It means a lot to me and really the whole industry. I get emails all the time thanking me, but not only me, all the guests, all the people who show up on a weekly basis, share their knowledge, because this is important. We're in this together. We want to make this industry better. And I really appreciate everyone taking the time. This week, I got a special guest. We are actually live at a CO2 rink um, in, is it uh, Pennsylvania? Yeah, in Pennsylvania. Super excited about this. Uh, I got a a friend that I just recently met, Michael Wassar from Simcoe Refrigeration. And uh, Michael has spent, I think the last five years he's been in the industry, about a year and a half now at Simcoe, but has dove into this CO2 and took it by storm, really getting it, really understanding and really learning. And been in this project, I believe, step by step through the whole thing. Uh, Michael, welcome to CO2 Monday. How are you doing, brother? Good. Thank you for having me, Trevor. It's a pleasure. Michael, why don't you uh, do a good introduction of yourself and let everyone know who you are and what you do? All right. So my name is Michael Weissar. I am a service technician for Simcoe Refrigeration here in the Northeastern United States. I graduated magna cum laude from Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology in 2017 with a degree in HVACR. Um, I spent five years doing more commercial and light industrial work before coming here to Simcoe. I've been here at Simcoe for a year and a half now. And and I tell you what, Trevor, I, I, I couldn't be happier with the change to natural refrigerants and being at a company that's really spearheading the way for CO2. Well, th- what I loved about it when we had a conversation on Friday, because me and Michael only met Friday and it was through a good friend of mine, uh, Benoit Rodier, um, is that Michael's very passionate. He wants to learn. He wants to get better. He wants to see these two new technologies. So I was super excited to have that conversation with him on Friday. And today, just just getting to know him even more is going to be uh, you know, it's going to be amazing. So let's talk a bit, little bit about uh, C, uh, natural refrigerant as well as the CO2. When did you start learning about CO2 refrigeration? So at the company I worked at prior, I was introduced to CO2 mainly because there was a large project going on and none of the senior techs wanted to work on the weekend. So I took the opportunity by storm and I actually worked with a couple of the engineers from Carnot Refrigeration on that startup. And Man, I tell you what, I didn't know if I was looking at the space shuttle or refrigeration system for the first time. So um, it was very overwhelming, and I couldn't believe that I had to understand what each moving part did. But, you know, as my knowledge of refrigeration as a whole has progressed, um, I've really found ways to break things down and form a greater understanding of these systems and how it's really not that complicated. If you understand refrigeration and see things from a very back to basics level, you can almost tackle anything that's out there. Yeah, I love that. And I love the way you put that too, because it always goes back to the basics of refrigeration. It doesn't matter. And I tell people, it doesn't matter if you're working on residential, like commercial, commercial, industrial, when you have that foundation of refrigeration and understanding how it's working, when someone just shows you the steps on CO2 refrigeration and the way it's working, the flows are happening, it can start to click just like that, which it sounds like it did for you. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. Awesome. So you started, did you do the construction on this job, commissioning? So let's talk about this specific plant here. Let's go through through it and, and just uh, get a good understanding because CO2 and ice rinks is, is not new to the industry, but it's growing popularity because we're getting into more of the transcritical CO2 systems in, in ice rink applications. Absolutely. So just to start out with, we are here at Santander Arena in Reading, Pennsylvania, home of the ECHL Reading Royals. Uh, They had an older Rothmar chiller, which had two eight-cylinder Micom compressors running R22. And I have reports from the rink staff that they had difficulty building ice during games. They had old, worn-out parts, uh, dirty underfloor. It, It was time for a serious upgrade. And we're right here in the middle of the city of Reading, very densely populated area. I know they were a little, little hesitant about going to ammonia. So uh, going with CO2, it just, it made sense. And I know the customer has been very happy with what we provided for them. Um, as far as the construction went, 
decommissioning the old rink was where I came and started. So I came, removed all the glycol out of the, out of the floor. Uh, we had rapid recovery here to remove all the refrigerant literally in a morning is about 2000 pounds of R22. Um, the construction crew came in, handed off the job to them. They worked through the summer night and day to make this project happen before the next hockey season. And I stepped in around August with Guy Foose from Manitoba. He came all the way down to Pennsylvania because he is a well-seasoned CO2 expert up in Canada. So having him here, just his intellectual asset was really, really key to this job and going well. So awesome. doing startup, uh, pardon? That's awesome. Oh, yeah. So I thought you were chiming in with something. But uh, yeah, going through the startup procedure, um, day one, you know, I have a, I call it the phone book. It's a huge commissioning binder with documentation from Carnot, Simcoe, Simcoe Automation Group. Man, I thought my mouth wrote checks that I couldn't cash. I was sitting there reading that thing religiously, you know, every, every day, you know, trying to get a grip on, you know, what exactly is going on here. But yeah, construction went very well. Uh, they actually had to knock down an entire wall to get the old chiller out and the new chiller in. Um, yeah, a, a lot of challenges being in the city as well as far as space. Um, yeah, it, it was a very interesting job, but, you know, the combined efforts of everybody at Simcoe really, it, it looked, it looked, it, it looked easy, but I yeah. know that it wasn't. What I really like what you said there is the uh, really one part is like, you were reading every day, you were investing in yourself, trying to learn. And this is as a technician is what you need to do. Even if you're experienced and you have a lot of, uh, you know, years behind you, you still got to invest that time in these new technologies. And reading, learning every day is one of the most important things you can do to develop your skills. Even if it's stuff that you already learned before, if you haven't read it in 10 years, there's probably something new that came out in that new binder, in that new manual, different manufacturer, different things to really enhance your skills to get you back on track. Do you know how much I learned from reading a Goodman residential install manual for a split system? There's so much knowledge everywhere. Yeah. You, know, you just have to read read a little bit deeper on some things. So, um, I love it. Yeah, so no, like so said, now, so now you guys got uh, the system up and running. Probably when did the hockey season start? September was it running, or when? When did you? Is so we did have it started in September. Yeah, um, I'm not sure when their first game was, October. but October. Oh, what's up, Guy? What's up? <laughs> Way to go, Mike. Trevor, he's an amazing mechanic, that man. Well, well, thank you. I'm glad he's here because we're going to learn a lot from him today. We're just getting started. It means a lot from you, Gabe. Appreciate that. But, um, yeah, no, beginning of October, there were definitely so, some challenges, but it was a healthy amount of challenge. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a firm believer if you're not struggling, you're not doing anything. So, uh, yeah, definitely a healthy amount of challenge. Uh, but, like I said, the combined efforts of everybody here made it look easy so okay so we got it started you got it started up in october their hockey season uh has been going on now it's probably still going on because we're in march now maybe it maybe it came to an end but uh how's the customer feel so they they went from r22 which would have been running for years and years i'm assuming and they when you said uh they were having issues over time you know maybe it's just because yep. of age and stuff because it's something you know that, that needs maintenance and stuff so what, how's the customer before we dive into the equipment and start looking at what mm -hmm. you guys built yeah. how's the customer feel from you know before last summer you know kind of nervous you know about doing this project because it is a big project it wasn't small i'm sure it was very time consuming very expensive you know because you, you're in a densely populated area how's the customer feel because i'm sure you have built a relationship with them since oh they're thrilled that they can actually build ice and have an ice rink you know that, that's one thing for certain um, I know at the beginning of the project, they were a little concerned about the new technology, but mm -hmm. we had to assure them that Simcoe has the experience with CO2 and ice rinks. So I think we really, really gave them a sense of security with this new system, with this being the first year. And, you know, we really haven't had any major issues. I mean, the largest problem we have here is intermittent power outages, and that's out of our control. That's completely, you know, not yep. up to us. Yeah. And, and that's what that's one of the big things that I've talked to lots of different customers and people tell me like, 
Customers are a little nervous about this new technology, CO2. What is it? There's a lot more valves. There's a lot more electronics. But at the end of the day, these systems are easier to work on now than the previous systems because there's just more monitoring. There's more alarms. There's more things that can notify a technician who understands how to read controllers today and understand that to really better equip themselves for a system running a longer period of time and less downtime. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I just muted you, Michael, by accident. I had to mute you, Guy. You're you're breaking up real bad, Guy, but we'll get to you. So, so Trevor, I'll, I'll chime in with what you said about the technology. You know, a lot of these customers coming from these R22 plants or older equipment, when they see not only the package, but the Simcoe automation groups design for the control scheme, it's like somebody getting out of a 95 Saturn and getting into a Tesla for the first time. It's the technology is just, it, it's stark. It's stark contrast. Yeah. And I, so, I love that terminology because that's what people get today. You're going from there to there. And it's yeah. it's so true with CO2 transcritical systems, and there's so many so much opportunity because with these systems now, and me and uh, Benoit uh, Radier had many conversations on it. Now you can you're not only doing the ice, but you potentially can do the whole facility with one refrigerant. You know what I mean? So, yeah. and uh, which is exciting about that. Maybe not on this this system per se, but for sure many systems down the road. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be CO2 for the whole building the whole arena and i'm excited to see a lot of those th those systems yeah absolutely the the future is uh, there's far greater things ahead than we leave behind that's for sure okay so so the customers are pretty excited about it the ice has been uh good how has the equipment been for you because this is your first co2 uh ice rink uh, uh, i'm assuming mm -hmm. so how, right. How's the yep. equipment for you? Because you said you had to read lots. You didn't understand, you know, stuff at first because you didn't know and never seen it before. That learning curve was, was been huge over the last year. Talk a little bit about that a little bit more. Yeah, so definitely learning was, it was a challenge, but like I said, it, it was certainly a healthy challenge. I mean, if you have the desire to learn something and you really open up your mind, you know, you can pretty much pick up anything, but uh, like I said, having having Guy around, having an amazing support system, not only my region of Simcoe, but Simcoe as a whole. And man, the documentation that came with this thing is it's non peril. I mean, just about anything you want, pictures, step by step, how to do certain maintenance, how to fix certain things, sequence of operation, yeah. and it's all there. And that's honestly my favorite thing about working for not only a service provider but a manufacturer is just your access to information. You know, yeah, for, for awesome. a tech for a tech up and coming, you really can't beat it. Yeah. And it's what you put in is what you get out too. Cause I can tell you're putting the work in, Michael. You want to be the best. You've been only doing this for a year and a half or at this company for a year and a half. And in an industrial format, like I know you're gonna grow real fast with inside this company. I do have a someone in the chat asking, is this system a direct or indirect CO2 system? I know we're gonna get into that in a little bit, but Maybe you just want to answer that right now for this question. Yeah, so no, we are not using the CO2 as the convective medium at this plant. We're refrigerating a secondary refrigerant, which is glycol, and we're circulating that through the cold slab to keep the ice temp. Yeah, and uh, am, am I, should I assume that it's because this is a retrofit design um, or um, not? I would, does... I would assume. I would assume that would be the reason uh, that would be a question for someone at engineering. Simco. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Why don't we dive in into a little bit more of the equipment now that we started with that question? Yeah, I yeah. Think so let, people... let, let's go ahead and move into the engine room then. So. so if anyone has any questions, you can throw it in the chat. Those who are listening on the podcast, you, you want to check out the YouTube video because um, there's a lot of good equipment that you're going to see in this uh this machine room. All right, so we're here in the machine room and just a disclaimer, we did have some work going on in here today, so it might not be the most presentable, but this is the package right here. The compressors are on the front. 
On the back side are the chiller exchangers for the brine, as well as the warm glycol. And if we step over here, this is our pump skid. This is what, answering your question prior, this is where we are circulating our chilled brine underneath the floor, as well as our snow melt pit pump and our warm floor pump as well. And then if you can step over here, this is our very, very messy computer desk, but this is our Simcoe automation group. Awesome. Control system for the, for the rink right here. Um, we can dive into that a little bit more later, but there's a lot of good stuff to be shared about that as well. So yeah, like I said, get a good, good shot of the, of the package there for everyone to enjoy. Yeah, it looks like really clean, lots of space to work on it, which I really like about these new systems. I'm seeing more and more of that, uh, especially in, uh, in larger rooms and plants like that. Um, quick question here. Did they put a new floor in before we dive into the equipment? No, they did not. Did not put anything. We, okay. we did pressure test. We did pressure test it. And uh, the one procedure I like about Simcoe, and Guy showed this to me, make sure it was followed, is the customer witnessed the pressure test and they signed off on it. They're not going by word of mouth or assurance that, yeah, it was, it was tested, trust us. So that's, that's the Simcoe difference right there. Awesome. I got another question so, here before we dive in. Uh, what is the capacity of a system like this? You know, you go right over here, to, it depends on the application. We can come right over here. I believe this one is, This one is 187 tons. Oh, 187. Okay, great. They're asking a kilowatt, so I'll, I'll do the conversion for them. But 187 tons. So that's a decent size equipment, piece of equipment. So you got, you have, uh, let's, let's go through the equipment step by step because I see there's quite a bit of compressors. You can do it from there. So I see you got eight compressors Pardon on me. that system. Pardon me one second. Yes. Oh, yeah, take your time. We got more questions popping up here, which is great. Yeah, the the rink was actually calling. I wanted to get a little more uh, a little more speech in before we let the system run and show it off. But yeah, so uh, if you're okay, I'm just gonna go step by step, follow yeah, the please. standard procedure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, all right, starting over here. This system has seven. Bitzer six cylinder reciprocating compressors and compressor number one runs on a VFD. The remaining compressors are cross line start. So compressor number one will always start first on the VFD followed by a rotation of the additional six compressors based off of runtime. So the top rack and the lower rack are shared on a common suction group. There, there's not a medium or two stage setup on this site. However, the top rack and the lower rack each have their own discharge header and temporite oil separator. There's actually two separators as opposed to one. The outlet of the oil separators come to two check valves where the discharge then becomes common for the system. Okay, and let's go before you keep going here. on and I'll let you go. Why, what was the reason of doing two separators? You know offhand? That I'm, not, I, I'm not aware of that. That would be a question for Ben. Yeah. Uh, but I will say I will say that we did have a issue on startup where they had ice in and we could not run a couple of the compressors and having the two separate oil separators was a blessing because we could keep the package running, but at a reduced capacity as opposed to shutting the entire thing down. Yeah. And usually that's what a lot of manufacturers do. So you can even do maintenances sometimes while it's still running if you need to run. So um it's a, a change compared to when you see in a lot of HFC systems. So I'm seeing this more and more on, on these, these CO2 racks, which is really cool. Yeah, yep, absolutely. So uh, were there any other questions before we move on from anybody? Um, one person just had a comment. If uh, they would have had to bust out uh, the floor uh, to change it to a direct system. So since you did a retrofit, it's easier to go back with the glycol, I believe. I guess that's what they meant. Um, yeah. you would have had to repipe the whole floor. So you would have had to bust it all out and change it all. So it's even a bigger job if you're going from an indirect to a direct, I'm assuming. So, yeah, um, absolutely. 
And there's a few more questions, but I think you'll answer them maybe going through. So I'll let you keep going. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll carry on here. We left off at the uh, oil separator. So um, oil return, we have, because we have two separate separators and we have two separate discharge headers, we do have two oil return solenoids that cycle back and forth to return our oil into our oil reservoir. Oil reservoir is at a lower pressure than our discharge, and we're running by the book a little over 100 differential between our reservoir and our compressor crank. Uh, we are running Emerson Traxxas oil switches on these Bitzer compressors uh, for oil return. And much like we have two independent discharge headers, we have two independent oil return headers going back to our compressors. So uh, coming up here to our discharge line, where we tee into a common port, this is really where uh, the system begins to shine, in my opinion. And before I go any further, I'd like to take a step back and just clarify one thing. There's really three major components to an ice rink refrigeration system. You have the primary refrigeration plant, which is our CO2 chiller. And then you have two glycol loops, which are independent from each other. You have your cold glycol, which is our secondary refrigerant which we are circulating underneath the floor via our pumps to maintain our slab temp. And then we have a warm glycol loop. So what we're using warm glycol for at this particular arena is snow melt and subfloor heat. Much like a freezer warehouse, we, it is imperative that we keep subfloor above freezing to prevent ground swell. Now we are reclaiming heat from the refrigeration system to facilitate these two functions without the customer spending any additional money in external fuel sources to make it happen. So this system only has snow melt and subfloor heat. However, in other applications, it's not only limited to that, you can do things like dehumidification, building heat and water heating. So that is the beauty of this system. And with CO2, Benoit actually uh, made this point the other day when he was here, you can get higher BTU capacity for heat recovery out of ammonia, but with CO2, because of the discharge temperatures that we run, you can achieve higher temperatures for water re heat reclamation. Yeah. So that's yeah, just that's, one thing I wanted to point. That's amazing. One right? to, that's one great thing about CO2. There's so many benefits and, and opportunity with their, its heat transfer uh, properties. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wanted to bring that up before we go to the back side of the package and we show off the heat exchanger for that because that is the next step so this is our motorized ball valve for our heat recovery so if we are not calling for any heat recovery the discharge gas is directed directly up to our gas cooler in the event which is very common that we are reclaiming heat we have a braze plate heat exchanger down here that the flow is diverted to and then we go up to our gas cooler so uh, when we're running transcritical or during warmer high load times, you know, the ability to harness as much heat as we can at that exchanger really helps out the system a lot. You're taking all that load or whatever we're extracting here, we're not putting on our gas cooler to extract under high ambient conditions outside, which here in Reading, Pennsylvania, we can get very humid, very warm days. We can have 95 degree days with high humidity it can almost be like Florida here in the middle of summer sometimes. So um, having that, in my opinion, is is a big win. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and but, that's important, right? Because these are the, you gotta understand where you're installing these different pieces of equipment and what the needs are of the customers, of the customer themselves. So it sounds like that's something the team would have worked with the customer to make sure that, you know, they're getting the best piece of equipment that fits their needs, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then going forward, so here's our discharge piping that we go up to our gas cooler. Here we have a Gunner adiabatic gas cooler. Um, if it wasn't four flights of steps up, I would take you up there and show you right now. But uh, this the CAG control system, we are sending it a optimal outlet temperature based on various conditions. So we send the signal to Guntner. The Guntner controller generates um, its own algorithm, which controls our target outlet temperature for our gas. So then our gas return comes down here to our 
liquid CO2 receiver or flash tank receiver, whatever your manufacturer, whatever you want to call it, function is the same. So uh, here's our gas return. Here we have two parallel HPV valves. Um, that issue I spoke of earlier, having two HPV valves is a blessing, having that redundancy, because um, that was actually the point of failure that we had when the strainer that came with it was punctured and one of the valves became contaminated. And we actually had to load shed and run it off one, which we were able to do, which is pretty amazing for it being summer when we had that issue. But anyway, so obviously we have our HPV valves. Those are like our metering device for the system. So we are going from, the system generally runs between 950 and 1200 PSI. I have never seen it higher than that. So we are metering our cooled gas into our receiver, which obviously we are getting our liquefaction of our CO2 and any flash gas that we need to recycle is recycled into the common suction group through our recycle valves. There is no dedicated machine on the system to recycling uh, flash gas. And like I said, it's not a two-stage system. So there's not a low and a medium temp suction group. There is only one common suction group for these machines. Um, because in my opinion, the conditions are so stable on an ice rink. You have a giant slab of ice out there, a giant thermal mass. And for the most part, the ambient conditions outside aren't swinging up and down like crazy. It, they go up and down with the day. The system runs very, very smooth. I mean, honestly, the biggest fluctuation is when those valves open up to recycle gas. You have a mi minor change in superheat. The valve drivers respond, and then things even back out again. You know, other than that, this, this is an ideal scenario for a CO2 chiller, in my opinion, as an ice rink. Awesome. Awesome. So, so how was the experience of setting this up? So you, I know you said you had some teams, some experts with you in there showing you, yep. teaching you some things. So um, the controllers, electronic valves, have you used those before uh, this job oh, site? Yeah. You have? Okay, good. Good. Mm -hmm. So yep. they look like those ones there, they, I can't, it's hard to tell from the video. You don't have to show me, but uh, are they Danfoss okay. or Sporlin? Who, who's yeah, we're using? We're, we're using Danfoss EEVs. Okay. Uh, we have a Danfoss uh, receiver controller and then the EEVs for the evaporators, which are DX are Corel drivers. Okay. Yeah. And I'll do it. So great products like these manufacturers work with CO2 all the time, developing the problems and a lot of them out there are great. And it, the big thing you need to know is just like Michael said earlier, you got to read those manuals. You got to understand how to program them properly step by step. This this stuff is hard stuff. It's not easy. It doesn't come easy because you got to read the manual multiple times to understand exactly what it's doing. But this is what's important. Putting this work in is going to make you better as a technician. Absolutely. And the endless access to information we have today, you know, really makes that possible. So. Okay. So, so we, we talked about it. You, you started at the compressors, you went to the oil separator, you went out to the heat exchangers where, you know, if you're, you're re doing reheat or not, um, you're sending it out to the gas cooler, it's coming down, hitting your high pressure valve, uh, back to your liquid receiver um and then back to your suction so yeah. anything else you want to so, talk about on the uh the the rack itself um honestly i would like to take a little bit more time here on this receiver because yeah. i think this is really the part that confuses a lot of people um we've had other customers come in that are refrigeration technicians or operators and they just they cannot understand how when you're running you know super critical how you can get liquid back and if you just look at a pressure enthalpy chart all you have to do is just think how do i get liquid i got to go down in either pressure or temperature we have an intermediate receiver right here from our high pressure and then we have our low pressure all you have to do is bring our pressure down our temperature will follow it's that yeah. simple yeah and i love so, it and i like the way you put it your pressure temperature chart you, you got to look at those. This is this is what I do in all my trainings. Doesn't matter if it's supermarket, if it's CO two training. I got you. Got to get into these enthalpy diagrams, log diagrams, molar diagrams, whatever you want to call them. But you got to look at them and get a good understanding. Is like how do I get liquid? You know what's the best way to do it? You know, and it's 
reducing that pressure down, right? Getting back into into your thumbprint, we'll say, <laughs> inside there and make sure yeah, that you, ha- yep. you have liquid. Um, I got a question here. What is the design pressure of the low side? The design pressure of the low side. Design pressure, it is... What's it running at? Oh, you mean what, what kind of suction pressure do we generally run? Yeah, yeah. I'm, that, I'm assuming that's what they say. What um, around three... It runs between 295 and 325 normally. Yeah. Okay, so that's PSI, everyone, because we got people from all over the world here. So... So, so, okay, good. I'll look at the, the, the computation on that, or I mean the conversion on that in a minute. Um, another question, uh, system controllers, which optimize the gas cooler pressure in the transcritical mode. Is that by uh, Simco? So the controller for the high pressure valve, I guess, coming from the gas cooler, or is that a Danfoss controller? We're, I'm pretty sure you said it was Danfoss. Using, yeah, we're, we're using Danfoss for that. Is that the 326 or is it the AK78? It's the... EKC, I'd have to double check that for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll they'll have yeah. a couple of ones. The uh, the three two six, as I told, and we talked about it many times with Dan Foss on here. That one's obsolete now. If you got one that's there's very few left, and they're moving to, I believe it's the AK seven eight one at seven eight two or seven eight three. I'll have to double check as well, but it's their high pressure. But you're using the Dan Foss one. Um, su- uh, suction superheat heat exchangers. Do you have those on the system? Yes, uh, I will show those to you when we get to the yeah, back of the okay. package. So. Yeah. Anything else you want to add for that liquid receiver? Do you feel that? Uh, and I thank you for explaining that because that's really important to wrap your head around CO2 is that when you're really warm, your ambient's high, you're in super critical or trans critical, above that critical point, you don't really have liquid, you don't have liquid coming down, it's a fluid. So you need to get back into yeah. that liquid phase, like uh, Michael was saying. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So uh, if there's no other questions, I think we'll go around the back side of the package and we'll follow our liquid flow then. Yeah, sounds good. All right, yep, let's do that. While you're, while you're walking there, are the brine pumps on VFDs? So there are two parallel, we're using glycol on our cold floor in this system, we're not using brine. Sorry about um, that, yeah. Nope, that's fine. Uh, we have a VFD on pump number one, uh, pump number two, which is our backup. It does not run alongside pump number one. That one is cross line start. Okay, awesome. So, thank you for answering that. Yep, thank you for the questions. All right, so back here we have our we have three filter dryers. As soon as we come out of our receiver with our subcooled liquid. Then we're routed up here, and this is where I believe we had a question. This is our, these two heat exchangers right here are our superheat and subcool heat exchangers. So what we're doing here is we are subcooling our liquid after our filter dryers from our receiver with the cold suction gas returning from our DX evaporators over here. Now, what we're also doing, Simcoe's control system is determining a target compressor superheat set point based on discharge temperature and or compression ratio. There is a motorized ball valve with a bypass line in parallel to this heat exchanger. So in the event that we need less superheat at the compressor, we can bypass that heat exchanger entirely to get as cool suction gas back to the compressor rack as possible. But in the event that we do not need, or we need to increase our superheat, that valve closes, directing our flow through the exchanger, and we get that subcooling effect, making sure we have high quality liquid going to our expansion valves. So I believe that answered the question that was asked before. Yeah, and that's awesome. And this is what's so cool about CO2, all these new ways to protect the system, run the system. Um, It it makes refrigeration so much fun, so much funner today. Oh, absolutely. It's fun when it's working, right? (laughs) Yeah, well, that's our job as technicians to to fix that, think outside the box. And like you said earlier, if you didn't have uh, any issues, then it would be hard to to learn new stuff, right? I I wouldn't have a job, so yeah. (laughs) But um, anyway, so over here, these are our evaporators. So these are our brace plate heat exchangers. We have six of them 
in parallel with each other. And the glycol flow flows through all exchangers simultaneously, regar uh, regardless of whether or not they're actually calling for cooling or not. So the way that we're controlling the amount of exchangers is based off glycol return temperatures. So initially, I guess we should cover the three ways that we can control this. Uh, we have multiple slab temperature sensors in the concrete measuring slab temperature. We have an IRC camera, which is an infrared camera measuring the physical surface temperature of the ice. Or we have temperature sensors in our return glycol. But for the most part, how we're running this is on slab or IRC. So based off of deviation from set point is how many exchangers we'll bring on. So the pump will be enabled when the slab temperature calls for it. But based on how many degrees away from our return glycol set point we are, is will enable the amount of exchangers and subsequent compressors. That's super cool. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, when the package initially starts up, the VFD compressor will run, and there's about a five minute delay between when that one starts and when, or we have a confirmation of run, and when the next compressor will start. So, that VFD compressor initially starting really allows the system to stabilize before we bring on more load and really start refrigerating. Um, once the additional compressors start coming on, obviously based on a runtime rotation, um, compressor number one, which is on the VFD, starts acting as a trim to maintain stable suction pressure. Yeah. So as we get closer to our, uh, as we get closer with our hysteresis to our set point, we can start shedding back compressors, bringing compressors back on. But I mean, on a day like today where there's absolutely nothing going on in that rink, um, it'll turn on and, and shut off in a fairly, fairly short amount of time and stay off for a very long time. Um, I believe the, I believe they have saved 20% on their energy and 40% on their water usage with this wow. new plant, as opposed to what they had here before. Wow. 20% on energy and 40% on the water usage. That is correct. Yep. That is huge. They only been they only been running for not even a year now. Correct. Yep. And, and guys so, says it's 30% energy in the in the chat. Of course. So, <laughs> even even better. <laughs> yeah, even better. So so and that's one amazing thing. So you're going from an older system. Uh, older refrigerant, old technology to a newer system, newer technology, CO2, and you're seeing this huge amount of energy savings and water savings. And I've heard about this already in multiple applications with CO2 where they're saving a ton of energy and money using CO2. And I, and I love hearing these stories because this is what it's, it's all about for, for the customer at the end of the day. You're doing all of this to help a customer out, helping their needs. And then now if you can help them save some some money so they can put towards something else with inside their organization is, is huge. Oh, absolutely. I mean, let's face it. The, the customers are the reason why we're here and, you know, we're able to have these great conversations and, you know, really grow and appreciate the industry. So. Yeah. I love yeah. it. And I love it that they took the a chance and the opportunity because this is scary for them as well. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a big job to do in a retrofit like this new technology, but he, CO2 is here. You guys are the experts, you know what I mean? And, and look, you're at the site as well. You're going to be there for them. If stuff happens, if there's issues and you know what I mean? And that's the big thing, what customer wants. They want to work with a partner who's willing, you know, to work with you. You know what I mean? If, if you need yeah, help, so if there's issues, you come in, you solve the problem with them. And that's what the partnership's all about. And I talk with more and more contractors and end users, and this is what they're looking for, more of a partnership. Stuff's going to happen. It doesn't matter yeah, what absolutely. the refrigerant is. So, so this this job was actually a blessing for us. So uh, he unfortunately had, had to be here from, from Manitoba. But for me, I live 45 minutes away from here in Lancaster, PA, uh, our supervisor, Kurt, lives 15 minutes down the road. Um, it, it really it really couldn't have been a better scenario as far as having people close by, you know, to make sure that this went over well. So, yeah, that, and that makes a difference. And that's and that's what it's all about. And I know if n nobody even lived there, you guys would have been close by anyway to make sure everything runs smoothly. Uh, a couple oh, more absolutely. questions. 
Um, do you have, if the power goes out, do you have a unit to make sure you don't uh, blow the charge or anything like that? So what is it? Yeah. Do you have like um, an auxiliary backup in case you lose power for a long period of time in the middle of the summer? Uh, no, I do not believe so. Okay. Uh, I don't believe you need that on the system. You might want to, I'd confirm with Ben on that though. Yeah. Well, we'll double check. Well, cause if it's the gas coolers outside, it's 95 or hundred degrees, unless you design the system for standstill pressures, what's the standstill pressure. If it's designed for standstill pressure at the hottest temperature, you know, it's a high pressure yeah, design. Okay. Yeah. So you don't I have to worry about that in the system. You don't need an auxiliary backup. It's designed for the high pressure. So yeah. even better, even better. Yeah. I didn't want to comment on that without knowing for certain. I, I appreciate that. And this is why you're an awesome technician, a refrigeration <laughs> professional. Um, another question. Um, I know every rink is different, but how long did it take to pull temp upon startup? Gee, how long did that take? Like, what, a day? Not even? I don't know if you heard me or not. It was not long at all. Yeah, you, you can uh, un, uh, unmute yourself if you want. And just you were breaking up earlier there. I, I wouldn't even know. I wouldn't even know how long it would take on a normal system compared to a CO2 system. Man, I mean, when this we, thing. When we started the plant up, it was 81 degrees. By about midnight, we were at slab temp. And that was at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So under 12 hours, we pulled the floor 60 degrees. Wow, that sounds very impressive to me. You can't do a walk-in box at a 40, 20 by 40 that no. quick. No, absolutely not. So, wow. yeah, I this thing really rips, man. Go ahead. I believe those were the numbers because I was even impressed on the uh, the glycol pull down stage. Yeah, that's that's wild. That is wild. I love that. Okay, like this is this is amazing. One of the one of the things I noticed while you were going through is you guys did a great job. But whoever's did the installation work on there, they did a fantastic job as well. I I can see from behind just looking while you were going through the the professionalism, the people who worked on that equipment, you know, did a great job, spent the time to make it look professional, look nice. Um, so, so I love, I love seeing that. Anything else uh, you want to add or anything else you want to talk about, Michael? Uh, not, not specifically. Um, you know, like I said, this was an, an amazing job. I, I am honored to have been a part of it. And, you know, I look forward to more CO2 projects going forward, uh, especially, here at Simcoe so yeah well you just you just started you, you you know what I mean you've been a year and a half in you did this project here you got this one under your belt you're well on your way um you're well on your way to doing many many more um another question what is the total charge do you uh, did you say that so I can't remember. so the nameplate was 800 but at the end of the day it was closer to 1100 1100 okay but mm -hmm. 1100 of co2 compared to you pulled out 2000 of r22 in the old rink is that correct Cor correct yes and so and uh i i will say this they had the refrigerant grade co2 available in reading at the local uh gas supplier so there was no hang time getting our refrigerant it wasn't like oh are we going to be able to get it it was it was readily available yeah Cause I hear all these things too. And yes, don't get me wrong, depending on where you're at in the world and what happens, uh, there might be a short, low amount of CO2 in that area, but for the most part, you can get it all over the place. All over North America, you can get CO2 uh, very easily for refrigeration applications. And, and like, I, like I was about to say, like 2000 of R22 at whatever it costs now per pound, or a kilogram, wherever you're from, compared to CO2 per pound per kilowatt, and you're using nearly half right there that's an uh, astronomical savings astronomical savings because one charge will pay for probably 10 well maybe not 10 I, i'm just making numbers up there but a lot of co2 yeah. charges absolutely absolutely so but yeah no um yeah i don't really have anything yeah. this is fantastic than that so oh, i want to thank you for taking the time to do this to show us uh, uh this amazing system it looks awesome there's a lot of things that I, I took away from this you know understanding the energy savings 20 to 30 percent water savings of 40 percent that is crazy talking about the different 
uh, design, you know, this is a retrofit going from 2000 pounds of R22 down to 1100 pounds of CO2. That That is awesome. And then even telling me that you pull down that ice within 12 hours from 81 degrees, That that is, yeah, I learned so much here and I got so many more questions, but this has been amazing. Why don't you let everyone know where they can get in touch with you, get a hold of you? Because I know I checked your Instagram page out. I think it's at, at chilling.perspective.com. You have yeah. amazing pictures. Why don't you let people know where they can get a hold of you, get a hold of your company? Uh, yeah, like I said, uh, if you want to reach out to me directly, I have an Instagram account, chilling.perspective. That is just a dump of photos that I have. Um, but yeah, reach out. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And uh, yeah, like I said, there's there's no one better in the ice rink industry, in my opinion, than Simcoe. So um, I'm so any ice rink questions, you. yeah. I'm so excited for you. I, okay. I really appreciate you taking the time today. I really appreciate all the participants hanging out. Anyone listen to on the podcast, this means a lot. The, just this right here is the steps towards a great future of the refrigeration industry. People like Michael taking the time to want to share his knowledge and share the his perspective on the new technology. He, like I said earlier, and I said it multiple times, it started a year, but a year and a half ago, really working on CO2 applications. And look how far he's come in one year. Where could you go in one, two, five, or 10 years working on CO2 equipment? I'm super excited for you, Michael. I'm super excited for the industry. And thank you so much for taking the time today. Hey, hey, thank you so much, Trevor. It's been, it's been a huge pleasure. Okay, you have a fantastic day. See you later. See you, everyone. Hey, you too. Hey, thank you for watching this video. I do hope it is bringing you a lot of value. If you are looking to grow and build your refrigeration teams and want them to learn CO2 refrigeration, head to the refrigerationmentor.com website. Click to contact us and let us know how we can build a culture around training inside your organization. Let's get a conversation going.